everybody and welcome to another fantastic edition of Let's Talk. I am Laughing Boy LP. I'm your host. Um, so this is like this is like a whole brand new thing. I haven't done one of these full series in like two years. The last time I recorded was like 2018. This is a new season. A whole new season. A whole new world we live in. And a whole new place to be. It's a brand new place with a brand new attitude. But I still got to interview them all. To be the best that I can be. Here with us today, <laughs> we've uh, we actually have a, a new type of content creator for us. Uh, last season, we've done mostly uh, all LPers and streamers, and um, we're gonna kind of branch out and start talking to new types of content creators, all celebrating video games in their own special way. Uh, here with us tonight, we uh, we've got a new. Con- I just said that. <laughs> here with us tonight. <laughs> Um, she, you can find her on twitch.television where, um, she plays different types of video games, but also likes to talk shop about music, sometimes with music theory, if I remember correctly. Um, you can also find her on YouTube where she does various video game and other nerdy franchise covers, um, as well as vlogs actually. Um, so if you would like to introduce yourself for us, please. Hi, so um, my name is Sab Irene. I primarily make uh, video game music covers on YouTube. I play the saxophone, but you can also see me play a lot of other instruments like piano, I sing, play the flute, clarinet, trumpet, uh, etc. Uh, I stream on Twitch where I like to do some piano streams, some gaming streams, and chatting streams. And uh, I recently just graduated from college. I got my bachelor's of music and music education. So I'm also a teacher teaching people of all ages, ranging from, you know, young children to like, you know, adults in their 50s. And I just have so much fun getting to do that. Awesome. And you've already answered our very first question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So uh, this first episode... uh, For those of you who are new to the show, uh, basically, we're just going to continue as we've done before. We interview different kind of content creators about who they are and what they do. Um, Those of you who have seen the series for quite some time now, we are actually going to be changing things up a little bit. So not only am I going to be interviewing new types of content creators, as I mentioned before, but we're going to be segmenting things out a little bit better. So instead of 10 episodes and every 20 minutes I go and stop. Um, We're going to be doing four specific episodes, each of their own topic, with at least two to four varying subtopics. And the very first episode we will get into today, tonight, this week, someday. (laughs) Getting to know you a little bit more. Sometime soon. One of these days. Look, it's the year of our Lord 2020. Um, Most people in history books will forget this year ever existed. (laughs) But I just wanted to let everyone know. As proof of 2020, because this interview may or may not come out <laughs> until <In> 2021. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, I make apocalypse jokes, but it's very pertinent this time of year. Oh, yeah. So we're going to get to know you a little bit more. And for starters, um, we've already explained a little bit about the kind of content that you create. Um, so we're going to go a little bit more in depth. What got you interested in playing video games? So um, I have two older brothers. And I used to watch them play video games all the time, but they never wanted me playing their video games. So I would wait until they would go to school and then I would play them. And <laughs> uh, probably the most scarring experience I can think of is they were trying to achieve like uh, like the Chow Heaven or like the, the graveyard one in, in Sonic Adventure 2. And you have to like buy specific eggs and raise them. And I bought an egg and the game saves immediately and I like freaked out because they would know that I played um but I I loved getting to watch them play and you know started picking them up myself I loved listening to the music uh ever since I was young so there was always nostalgia in that as I like got older and would hear stuff so yeah that's Mm. pretty much what got me into games was my two older brothers and then my friends liked video games too as somebody who is the younger person of a family and have like had had to like live with older people i absolutely do understand the concept (laughs) of do not touch my stuff yeah (laughs) um what aspects about gaming do you really enjoy the most like is it the camaraderie of like playing with others um do you like the stories of games like collecting things what about games really like appeal to you definitely stories um 
I think I always try to, even in the modern day, as we can learn so much about games as people are trying to find the leaks everywhere, I love the mysticism in video games. There's kind of like a magic to it where I don't really know what's going to come next. So I try to not really read into games too much about what they're like, um, not even really even to know the plot. I just kind of see a little bit. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'll try this or I'll ask friends for opinions. I'm like, hey, you know what kind of games I like. Do you recommend this? Um, So I kind of like that. I I like getting attached to a story. So RPGs are kind of, you know, games that I really enjoy. And um, I mean, I love getting to either play with friends like things like Smash, Mario Kart, but also getting to just talk about the games with friends, especially as I'm going along, I always come up with a lot of crazy theories as to, I'm like, well, I think this is going to happen, or I think this is going to (laughs) happen, and I have friends who very silently listen to me because they don't want to spoil anything, (laughs) Um, but they just listen to me talk on and on about the most absurd theories, and then sometimes when they're true, I'm like, oh my god. (laughs) (laughs) And they're just sitting there going like, "Mm mm-hmm. They're mm -hmm, like, yeah, 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 I didn't want to say anything. (laughs) (laughs) Um. How did you become interested in music and then how did the interest between like video games and music kind of merge together in the way that they did? Right. Um, So everyone in my house loved music. Like my parents had played a little bit when they were kids. Uh, My brother played a little bit of guitar like my other brother and I, um, we like did some music stuff when we were young, but my mom bought a piano for our house uh, when I was like five years old and I would sit and bang at the keys all day long and people would be like, you like the new piano? I was like, no. I'm like, cause I can't play it. <laughs> so I asked my mom, I'm like, can I please take piano lessons? So that was very short lived. I took lessons for like five years cause I didn't like any of my teachers. Um, but well, <laughs> yeah. as common when you're a young child, but, um, as I started kind of getting back into music cause I, I stepped away for a bit in late middle school, um, I started learning how to play pop songs and then video game music because video games were always kind of a staple for me in my life, you know, as I was young, as I started playing them more. Uh, so I just started kind of weaving the two together and then I was trying to find a very specific cover. I wanted to find a cover of Bramble Blast, um, aka Stickerbush Symphony <laughs> from, uh, yeah. cause I heard it through Super Smash Bros and that's the version I knew. And um, I found a person who was doing viola co- uh, viola covers, um, but I ended up watching a cover of Corneria. <laughs> Not even, I couldn't even find Bramble Blast, but <sighs> I found this person's channel. And from there, I found so many people in the community. I was like, this is something I've wanted to do. And now seeing that all these other people are doing it, you know, that motivates me to see that there's a community doing this and they share my interest and my, you know, passions. So... And who who was the what was the channel? Um, her name is a uh, X Classical Cat X. She's not super active anymore, but I mm. loved getting to watch her videos because I found um my good friend Eight Bit Brigadier who plays the flute and he's in my quartet. Uh, then I found Terracy Music, Insane in the Rain, and uh, Zorsi. So like those I, those are the first five that I remember finding all through her and a cover that she did with two uh, other VGM artists. That's awesome. Yeah. So what are some other hobbies or topics that you are interested in right now? Ooh, I love baking. Baking is like, I've been baking since I was a really young kid. Um, and it's something that it just always de-stresses me. So when I was actually in my last year of college, I was stressed out. Uh, a little bit more than I was in the previous years because everyone's like, what are you going to do after this? I'm like, hmm, I'm going to bake. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> like, I tried making, like, breads, macarons, donuts. Like, I love to just try doing whatever because my philosophy is, I'm like, what's the worst thing that could happen? I'm like, as long as I don't burn down, like, my apartment or the house or something, I think I've won. So, um, <laughs> I was going to say that is the worst thing that could Yeah, happen. that is the worst. But, like, otherwise, like, you know, what, I burn something? I'll oh, just try making it again. Um, that and I love crocheting. Um, I make scarves a lot. Um, I'm basically an old grandmother because I love to bake and I love to crochet and I love cross stitching because um, I did perler beads when I was a kid. So, I can use the oh. perler bead patterns and make the cross stitches, which, you know, they don't break. Like, you know, perler breeds always break after you iron mm. them. So, you know, I've made a lot of gifts for people by like cross stitching and crocheting. And it's just, it's very therapeutic for me. 
I remember before Perling, there were the color beads that you could buy from like the craft stores. Mm-hmm. And I was very into like the actual like beads that you could make. And then when I saw Perler beads, I was like, wait, isn't that the same thing? <laughs> but I'm actually like, <laughs> I really like that mindset of, um, you know, if you really like if you mess up or make a mistake or something like that, you just kind of get back up and try again. Yeah. Has that. Have you always had that mindset? Is that something that no. kind of got reinforced? Or? <laughs> no. Oh, my God. I used to be so hard on myself. Um, I didn't start playing the saxophone until I was 14, um, like very end of middle school. And when I started, I could play by myself. But when I would have to like play in band class, if I couldn't come in with everyone at the start of a piece, I used to sit there and not play because my philosophy philosophy was, well, if I can't even come in with everyone, what makes me think I can play the piece? So I was like Mm. super harsh on myself when I was 14 and I kind of was always so mad at myself whenever I made any sort of mistake because I was like, oh, I know how to do this. I know how to do this. So um, it wasn't until I was applying for college and uh, prepping for auditions that my teacher um, said something that really stuck with me. And that was he's like, you know, they're not looking for perfection. They're looking for potential. Like, you know, you're going to make mistakes and, you know, music is not 100% ever like we strive for it but we never attain it and it just like that really resonated with me and I was like wow I'm like it really is okay to make mistakes as long as you reflect and grow from it so that's why I I don't get too mad about mistakes anymore no I really like that and I think you know personally speaking Mm -hmm. um there have been a lot of like anxieties that you know and I'm sure everyone else goes through this a lot um with especially with like social anxiety and things of that nature and uh you know there's always the fear of failure or not even the fear of failure but there's like even a public embarrassment aspect that can go along with it Mm -hmm. and I feel like that's a very hard lesson to not only learn but to stick with it is the fact that you know perfectionism because perfectionism can stop a lot of creative endeavors from happening we feel like we have to be perfect in everything. And Mm -hmm. that can also lead into things like procrastination or I'll get it done someday. And it's the fear of making those minor or major mistakes and not being able to recover from those. Um, That can be a very big hurdle to jump over. So the fact that like it's a, I'm, you know, congratulating you for the, (laughs) your ability to kind of like, use those lessons and take those in and internalize them the way that you have done so. I I really try and I and thank you I I think about I, Emil has probably said something like this when you've asked him but um because people are always like well when's the best time to start content creation and they're just like oh well like you know I'm, I'm waiting to get like really good equipment it's like in the time that you spend worrying about like that first release you could have made like 20 videos and learned so much from that instead of just like worrying about that first one like you're your first stuff is always going to be terrible and you just got to accept that because it's your starting point. Yep. That is one of his big pieces of advice yeah. um, during that interview session where he's like, just don't start with your most favorite game. Yes. I remember. You're never going to like the first thing you put out. Yeah. And so you're always going to look back and be like, I'm way better than I was back then. Right. And it's such a true statement. Mm-hmm. And it's really not even... It has nothing to do with like I had bad equipment or I, you know, was immature. I mean, part of that plays into it, but really just has to do with you just were not experienced and you gain that experience only by doing it and making and learning from those mistakes. Exactly. Moving on uh, in terms of talking about different games and the games that you like, uh, if there was one game that you were given and asked to remake it, what would it be, and what could you add to it to make it yours? That's so hard. Because <laughs> um, I, I feel like most people would be like, she's going to say Chrono Trigger, because Chrono Trigger is my favorite game of all time. Um, yeah. But honestly, I, I don't really want there to be an update. A lot of people are like, I wish that Chrono Trigger would get the same treatment as Final Fantasy VII, and I don't really wish for that. I like Chrono Trigger, as is, I would say. Um the the two games that that come to mind are um, Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door because that's one of my all time favorite games, um, or the Pokemon Diamond Pearl Platinum uh, game because that is my favorite Pokemon gen and both those games 
hold a very special place in my heart and I would love to be able to contribute to the music um you know either kind of doing what Jules did in uh Cadence of Hyrule where it's like getting to create my own soundtrack like you know a Sab Irene soundtrack edition that you can like use in the game or something um or even just recording on a, a few tracks like for a remaster of a game or something I mean that would be amazing yeah just that'd be, be sick that opportunity yeah awesome um on the other hand uh do you have a guilty pleasure game and by that i mean uh a game that you enjoy even if it was not reviewed well or publicly liked what's your sticker star (laughs) um i don't know because i i've mostly played a lot of like mainstream games um because that's just what I was around the the only game that I can think of um and it's not even like a guilty pleasure because like I have no shame in admitting the games that I played is um <laughs> uh I honestly loved uh Ham Ham Heartbreak on the Game Boy Advance <laughs> um I like I don't know why I just love that Hamtaro game I watched it Hamtaro as a kid and I had so many Hamtaro it wasn't even funny Um, but I actually just found the game as I was like going through old stuff and I was like, and I, apparently I had like one for the Game Boy and I didn't even remember, but I loved getting to play Ham Ham Heartbreak. So I guess that would be my answer because some people are like, oh, Hamtaro's dumb. And I'm like, actually it's iconic. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I mostly remember the fact that you couldn't go five seconds Watching Cartoon Network without seeing a Hamtaro reference or a commercial. Yeah, um, pretty much. <laughs> but yeah, I had heard about the Game Boy games, and I only heard recently that people are just kind of like fondly remembering it. I'm like, really? Okay. I didn't <laughs> know that they were good. So, <laughs> all right. There's some good uh, music in those two. That was like, there was one level that was like a, a haunted mansion, and it creeped the crap out of me. Um, and it's because the music was so effective. Um, I almost said it was called Boo Manor. I'm like, that's definitely not what it was called. I don't remember. <laughs> but it's it's been like probably 12 years since I played the game. But I have fond memories of like going to visit family. And because I didn't want to deal with them, I would just go into the basement and play uh, Hamtaro. <laughs> <laughs> this is my escape. Yep. <laughs> and then uh, finally for this section, do you do you have any favorite game related memories? Um, so maybe the opposite of your heart attack moment from earlier. Um, I mean, one of the first things that comes to mind was, uh, when I was in college, actually, um, cause there's so many things from when I was a kid, I'm like, ah, those were okay moments. Um, but when I was first playing through Chrono Trigger, I, like a friend of mine was playing through it at the same time and I was hanging out with them and a few of their friends and I was stuck on this boss fight and they had just beaten it like a few hours prior so I was like stuck because I didn't read this one piece of information in the game that was super helpful to the fight because I'm a button masher I just skip through text all the time so I was getting super pissed at this fight and I like got so angry I threw my DS at my friend and I was like you do this so I fell asleep (laughs) for like 10 minutes and they like shook me and they're like hey I beat it I'm like are you joking right now (laughs) um so and it's funny because it's my favorite game um so it, it just made me laugh and then they beat the final boss like the day, like, I, w- I happened to be there, and they beat the final boss, and I kept losing, um, and I just remember trying it a few times in my dorm room before my roommate got home, and it magically worked. I was on my third attempt. It was, like, 11.30, which was late for me my first year of college, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I decided to put on Netflix, because I always like white noise, so I just put something on, and like it worked and I beat the boss and it was like a few minutes before midnight and I just remember like crying finally get to hear the end credits theme and context to the game and just how much I loved it so Chrono Trigger had a few funny moments because I was playing it with a friend at the same time awesome and uh, yeah that's I think like there's a community aspect about gaming that I really enjoy um like the you know being able to do the water cooler moments and like talk yeah. to your friends about playing some games that you all like um absolutely yeah just being able to like experience it together in some way shape or form and i 
think that's what plays fairly well into things like Twitch. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. When people get to like share their experiences with the game. Um, And that's kind of what I like about Let's Plays, whether they're done on Twitch or, or YouTube is that you know, you might have memories from a game, but you're also getting to hear some stories from other people, um, you know, because there, there are some pretty hysterical stories out there from from friends of ours of, like, the LPs that they do and just, like, their first impressions of games, what they did in this, like, certain situations, and you're like, wow, I, you know, I definitely didn't even think about something <laughs> like that, or sometimes you have those moments where you're like, yep, I did that too. I'm glad I'm not the only person who did that. <laughs> um, yeah. Kind of thing. And the other moments where you're just like, I don't know why you would think that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So we're going to move to our second half of this uh, of this episode. Um, for those of uh, who are used to the old methods, we don't stop at 20 minutes anymore. <laughs> so... We're just going to keep this gravy train rolling, and we're going to talk about the history of your channel now. Yay! And, <laughs> yeah, the meat and potatoes. Um, so, about your channel, how did you decide on your online persona slash name? It's fairly similar to your real one, so... It's pretty much my name. Um, the way I looked at it was, I started making videos when I was 16. I was like, I don't want to put my full name out there, because there's a bunch of interesting characters, I'll say, on, on the internet. Um, Creeps and weirdos. Yeah, thank you. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> but, um, so I, I took, like, my my name and I shortened it, uh, um, but I do go by Sab. Like, pretty much everyone except my family and people from high school, like, call me Sab. Um, mm-hmm. And then Irene is just my middle name. So it's, it's my name, but not my full name as, it was like a protection standpoint, um, which it still is, but I just, I really like how it sounds, um, you know, because I didn't have a name like, you know, uh, music lover 47, 47, 47, or something like that. I don't know. I was trying to, I don't want to like offend people's <laughs> names, but um, I wanted to have something that was re- like, you know, connected to who I was instead of just having something a bit like random kind of thing, like, uh, like yeah. Chugga Conroy. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't. Look, never enter your name in a cartoon orbit name randomizer. <laughs> I oh mean, I there is something to that. I think what what it comes down to is um with a lot of like older YouTubers, there was mm-hmm. this idea. I think one of the things somebody mentioned to me and I never thought about it was um like play people's like online screen names and other things like uh PlayStation Network and Nintendo uh you're, if you're really old, you usually like to do random words and numbers. And I've noticed that with a lot of other people, like a lot of newer gamers, newer generation gamers, they're mm-hmm. just kind of like, nah, just like a word is fine. Like a name is fine. Like this yeah. is my name. It's not like Fry X Bender X 420. Like, yeah. it's, <laughs> like that's a very, I don't know, just kind of like a millennial slash like old internet person kind right. of thing. And so... Um, yeah, that definitely permeated into my life Mm -hmm. until I just kind of, but especially when you're doing Twitch and YouTube, um, you want to kind of have that branding of this is who I am. And if you're going to kind of put yourself out there for other people with in terms of like sponsorships or, um, other kinds of opportunities, then having an appropriate name, having a more professional, yeah, something more professional sounding. It's not like... Um, I was talking with my parents about this recently, and I was like, it's not like I'm like, hey guys, my name's Rachel, but I go by Sab Irene. It's like, it is my name, so (laughs) I don't feel too weird about it, and it's nice because I don't feel like it's really a separate persona, like, that. you know, what you get is, like, what I am on on my channel and just how I am on Twitch and stuff. It can be weird. Just with, like, 10% more patience. Yeah. I, you know, do people, you know, when I do a lot of the Zelda universe work, the question comes up often where it's like, do I use my name or do I use my name? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I think cutting that out of the equation, if you're comfortable with it, is pretty powerful. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. When did you start creating videos and what got you into making them? Um, I think... It was 20, it was June of 2013, I released my first video. It was a cover of Astral Observatory from Majora's Mask. Uh, 
I wish I liked it more, and it's not even because it's like, oh, it's my first video. It's that I played wrong chords in the Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought the chords were at the time, and then I was like, oh, those are not the chords. But um, I did it, like, in... It's funny, because people, now that I'm back home, people are like, whoa, this is different than what I've seen. I'm like, this is where the video started in this house. Um, <laughs> so, like, I did it downstairs where our piano is um, on my, Mac, like, 2012 Mac laptop. Um, with the nice. webcam like stacking it on like these little tables so that you could see the piano I had like the weirdest way of doing it um, I didn't have like a DAW so it was literally the webcam audio and video um, like using the internal microphone so you can hear the nice Mac fan because I was probably <laughs> recording god knows how many attempts <laughs> um, it's like the it's like the musician equivalent of when you record your gameplay footage with a camera facing the TV. Yes, it, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, what got me into it um, was again just finding like these people in the community, like these like-minded individuals who shared my interest and my passions. Um, because you know, my brothers liked video games; they liked music, but they never really like coincided the two um even though we all played music like we all played an instrument at one point in our lives but for me it just kind of stuck where I was playing saxophone I like to sing I like to play piano and then as I got to high school um I started picking up like flute and trumpet um and I don't know it was something I'd been thinking about and I just after seeing uh the cover that I talked about earlier of a uh, corneria I was just like all right you know, I found people that aren't covering it on just piano or guitar, which I, I love everyone who does v VGM cover music. But to see people who are doing it on, like, flute, viola, trumpet, saxophone, like, that was really cool for me because I had never seen that before. So it was like, all right, there are people who are like me. So, yeah. you know, why am I not doing this when I, you know, like the same things? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think having that um, support group is really powerful. Kind of yeah. goes back to like how that community aspect too. Right. What was your biggest challenge in starting out? And then what, how were you able to like overcome any of those challenges? <laughs> um, I would probably say the, f the biggest challenge for me was that I didn't want to copy someone else and I was so paranoid about that because I was like oh my god what if they watch this video even though I only have like five subscribers I'm like what if they watch it and then they yell at me because I'm copying them like I, w I was so self-conscious because I didn't want to like take anyone's work from them um you know, it's just like, oh my god, if I include a saxophone, like, I'm, I'm copying Insane in the Rain music when that's not really how it works. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. that was my process where I'm like, oh, like, you know, I like how they did this song slow and it's originally fast. I want to do it slow. I'm like, wait, that's copying them. Um, so, like, literally any little thing I was freaking out about. Um, but as I started releasing more content, I started to really find my style and what I was looking for. Um, and it's still changing because people are like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, mm. <laughs> I'm like, I don't really know how to describe it because I'm like, I do saxophone stuff. They're like, so you do jazz. I'm like, not always though. So I, I like, <laughs> never know the label to put uh, like for what I do because I do video game music covers, but I do them on a bunch of instruments and I also do theory videos. So it's hard to like encapsul encapsulate in like one sentence, like, hey, what do you do? And I'm just like, uh, YouTube. <laughs> music on YouTube? Yeah. I'm a yeah. content creator where I make music of video game like you know I cover video game music but hey you did it I did it I'm here <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I think like as I started listening to more music and just talking with more people like in the community and just you know meeting more people and like getting feedback on my work that definitely helped me find my voice and like what I was really trying to do because YouTube just started out as a fun thing that I was passionate about where I was like hey I just want to show what I can do because I love music I love video games I want to show that um but you know it's it's turned into more than I ever could have imagined uh, at this point so I'm um, it's like crazy that that little like 15 year old sab was just like I'm gonna post a cover of Majora's Mask on the piano and then here she is now <laughs> like almost 23 years old like completely different than what I would have thought from when I like hit upload on that first video all that time ago and you still have your whole life ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, was there any moment where things finally clicked and then you realized that your channel was like becoming something bigger than you imagined it was? And like, how did that feel? I think um, it was going to my first convention um, when I went to MAGFest back in 2016. It was my senior year of high school. Um, and I had taken off from school, which is something I never did. Like, I never missed school. Um, <sighs> so people thought it was really weird. They're like, you weren't in class. I'm like, your point? Um, but that's when I got to finally meet these people that I had been like, you know, uh, talking to, watching, working with for like three years. And so to like have that true sense of community and have some people come up to me being like, oh my God, I like your covers. That's when I kind of started to feel like, holy crap, like this is real. Like, you know, to me, it was just a fun little thing to do. But as you know, it just kind of started picking up more momentum as I, you know, really became invested in this community, trying to meet the people and work with them. Um, I feel like that was one of the, the biggest moments and just like gradually over the years going to more cons, meeting more people. Like I think about my first PAX East, um, I was a freshman in college and uh, Jules, uh, yeah, Jules, Adriana, Carlos and I we were doing a signing with our MCN and maybe like three or four people knew who I was and it was kind of weird because I didn't know if they like wanted me to like sign something or if they were just going to pass by. I had no idea versus like our last year at PAX, um, which was earlier this year, right before the shutdown. Yeah. I, I think like 90% of the people knew who I was and that was like so crazy. Like four years ago, no one really knew anything about me and I never expect people to but it was just like that really nice experience where people were like I really love your music and I'm like really <laughs> I'm like you listen to my music <laughs> um you know so it was kind of a nice moment where people have always known a lot of my friends um because they've just been doing this for a long time um and they do really awesome work so it was, it was kind of nice to you know feel like I was at that level, quote unquote, um, <laughs> even though, you know, we're all part of a community and we all, you know, really respect each other and support each other. But yeah, cons, I think was, that was the big moment. I definitely feel that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, while you were talking, I was like, wait, when was my first MAGFest? And I think it might've also been 2016. Really? Yeah. I, it's either 2015 or 16. And mm -hmm. I'm the only way I'm trying to figure it out is like, trying to look at the trg <laughs> panel at 26 do i remember this no yeah i think um being able to go out and it becomes more real like as soon as yeah. people start recognizing you and either by your voice or by seeing you mm -hmm. and kind of going like i know what you do and you're kind of like you do yeah i there's always really? like a surprise for me even like seven years in people are like oh my god i love your music i'm like you listen to my music <laughs> you like my what you what it's like you kind of forget you did youtube right in that very moment and you're yeah. just kind of like what are you talking about <laughs> what would you say is the biggest improvement you've made since you've started and then what aspects would you say still need improvement as for the the biggest improvement i think like just having more confidence in myself um because like, I, I have a lot of wacky ideas, but sometimes I shy away because of the thought of failure, um, you know, to not really do it. So I've really just kind of gone all in and really just been like, well, you know, I, I don't really care if people like this. Like, you know, I'm proud of it. And it makes me happy. Like, and that's kind of, that's kind of what's most important to me at the end of the day is that I'm proud of my work, um, mm -hmm. you know, because I want to share it with people. But, you know, it doesn't mean anything to me. OK, I can't say anything, but it doesn't mean a whole lot <laughs> if like thousands of people are like, oh my God, I love this, but I don't like it because, you know, then who am I really doing it for? Because I make music, you know, because it brings me great joy and I want to share that with people. But, you know, I feel like it's weird if I'm not enjoying it. Um, yeah. And I think we'll, we do have a couple questions later on yeah. in there that kind of touch on that topic too. So then so. I will stop talking about that because I don't want to spoil the things <laughs> to come. Um, <laughs> I would no, say, we can just go more in depth. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, and j I think like also I've gotten a lot better at the instruments that I play because I went to music school. Um, so, you know, I got a lot of time really getting to develop and hone my skills. Um, I took, you know, saxophone lessons for four years with like an amazing teacher. Um, 
but like I still got to work on other instruments through my music ed program, um, which pushed me to like, you know, I played stringed instruments like violin and cello, never played those in my life. Um, so I, I became more comfortable with the idea, I think, of making mistakes. Like that kind of helped boost my confidence, which I think has been able to help me make a lot more content that I might have been skeptical about in the past. Um, just like trying super wacky things. I'm like, hey, what if I took like a metal song and turned it into city pop? Like, you know, <laughs> that would actually be really fun. Oh, it's oh, it's in the works, my friend. It'll probably come out before <laughs> this um, if, if I'm lucky and get it done. Um, my goal is to oh, get it out I mean, like in a few weeks. <laughs> I mean, we I still have all of the 20s oh my God. to get this done. So I think you have plenty of time to okay. get this out before I get this out. <laughs> I think it seems to me that it's gotten a lot easier for you to try new things because you were in environments that not only gave you positive reinforcement, but also you just kept trying new things. Do you feel like that gets easier over time? Yes. And I think that that's a great summation of the babbling I just did for like five minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think like when you're in a place where an environment where it's okay to make mistakes and experiment, um, that definitely helps you feel more comfortable. And that's what I try to like push with all my students I'm like it's okay to like you know most of music is experimentation that's why people are always like well I, well, I, I don't want to play it because I'm not going to play it perfectly I'm like who cares <laughs> I was yeah. like experiment figure out that oh I don't want to do that or oh that's not what that sounds like you know it's better to find that out than to not try at all um, I think sometimes what's helped yeah. me in those occasions is not knowing if it's difficult at all right um, cause there are times where, I mean, I've played certain RPGs where I've just never done the post game because I'll read it in a guide or something like that. And it's like, this is pretty difficult. And I'm like, okay, well then I won't do it. Yeah. Um, but what's helped me in like later games, especially now that like strategy guides are a dying breed, um, <laughs> I'm going into almost everything blind now. And so I'm just kind of like, that wasn't so bad. And then yeah. I go on the internet and it's like, that was really hard. And I'm like, oh, well, cool. <laughs> like, I did it. <laughs> So maybe yeah, so that kind of helps yeah, too, like not sure. knowing what it entails. Not knowing what it entails and not assuming that everyone has the same like skill set as you because like for some people they'd be like, oh my God, I find it really hard to arrange something for like, you know, 10 instruments in a cover. And I'm like, I find that very easy. Like just for like for what yeah, I do, yeah, yeah. but I don't like to assume like, you know, that anyone can do what I can do. And there are things that people can do that I definitely can't do so I try not to assume or like even give an impression of like what I think about something because I don't want to color someone's perception of yeah. um, like I did that a lot with my, my kids with like music stuff where like we would have them listen to a song but we would not tell them what the song was called or who it was by we're just going to be like you're going to listen to a song write about what you think about it what do you like about it what do you not like about it you know because then that way it wasn't, you know, because if we could have said, okay, we're going to play this great, like, you know, not even great, like, hey, we're going to play a song by Justin Bieber. And half the kids would have been like, Ugh. So um, <laughs> they would have just, you know, they'd have been like, oh, I don't like Justin Bieber. And like, I don't either. But, you know, if there was a song that I thought that he did a good job on, then like, I'd be like, yeah, that's a good song by Justin Bieber. But things like knowing the artist, the genre, the title, you know, it can change our perception. Watching what other people think of it. Um so I think like it's it's good when th the community that I'm in isn't ever trying to be like, oh, well, you know, if you try to do an album, like that's going to be really difficult. It's like, you know, for some people putting together albums is difficult. And I think it's a very situational case where sometimes it's a little bit smoother than others. So I never try to assume that my students or just people are going to be able to do what I do and vice versa that I can do what they do. Um, right. You know, and that's the support thing where it's like, don't assume. Um, yeah. Because you know what they say when you assume. You make a butt out of everyone. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think an, that's what an they updated, <laughs> yeah. It's an updated version of the same. <laughs> um, I think that the other thing you asked was what what's something that I, I need to improve on? Was that part of yeah, the question? Yeah. And, and, you know, let, this isn't like the let's be hard on ourselves hour, but. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would say. Um, Things that I want to strive to get better at, I'll say, um, is definitely 
mixing because mixing is so situational it's different every single time and there's just so much that I don't understand about it because people years ago were like yeah just do these types of things so like I've used that as my foundation and as I get students they're like well why do you do this I'm like because someone told me to do it five years ago and I never questioned it Um, yeah I saw a YouTube (laughs) video and that's all I needed (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's like yeah. or I just ask someone and they told me this is what to do so I'm trying to like go back and really understand bother friends and ask so many questions I'm like wait, wait wait I'm like so why do we do this thing or how do I do this and I really have them walk me through and like I just try I tell them like can you just like explain it in words first and then I'll try messing around and then if not can you like hop on a discord call with me and just kind of walk me through it and I've friends who are very nice about that um that Mm -hmm. and like filming um because I want to get like a wider camera lens to like actually Mm, have nicer looking shots and as I'm like learning stuff about lighting um you know so I I would say that those are my two weakest um I can't even think of the word links I guess yeah yeah, the two (laughs) weakest links like the the two weakest parts of like the the content creating process for me because like I I really love arranging I love recording I've learned to like video editing more I used to despise it but now I'm just having a lot of fun with it um so I think like the mixing which really helps get that polished thing and then you know the filming like what people see just like kind of cleaning those up a bit I think will be a great help yeah and I think again like in terms of making improvements, sometimes it really can just be the equipment. Um, other times it's really just trying to gain a better understanding. And I do like that mm-hmm. you're willing to ask those questions. Like, I think anybody wouldn't be bothered to try to explain it to you unless they're just kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I did it. <laughs> like, right. It just made sense to me. But um, the the fact that you are willing to ask those questions also can kind of lead to even better things. Because if you're willing to ask the questions and nobody can really answer it, then usually that allows you to kind of be like, well, I don't want to do it that way. And let's try to see if there's anything else you can do with it. Yeah, I think like a big thing is that, you know, I really try to work on it on my own first because I think that's how you learn the most. But, um, you know, then asking questions and then having the person kind of like walk you through it instead of like doing it for you. I think that's such a huge difference. Um, because you're not going to retain it if someone just does it for you versus if they walk you through it or they're asking you questions to help you get it. Um, yeah. You know. Well, and it shows that you have already tried to make the understanding of it yourself. You right. are very serious about the topic and it's easier to teach somebody that is willing to at least try, fail, ask questions, try to understand it better. Yeah. And I think that makes it a lot easier for people to want to help you. For sure. Uh, if you had one moment or an event that you wish you could relive all over again, uh, what would that be and why was that moment so special for you, channel career-wise? I guess for a moment to relive, um, it would be actually uh, MAGFest. Um, this past MAGFest, um, it was my favorite one because I got to like give a panel with friends, which I've been doing for years. I do like a music theory panel with uh, Family Jewels, Insane in the Rain, 8-Bit Music Theory, and myself. We've been doing that for mm-hmm. like three years now. Um, I got to perform, um, not at the main stage, but the Belvedere, uh, like the lobby bar. My qu- uh, my yeah. quartet got to play, which was super yeah. cool. Um because, you know, we're just like a ragtag group of, of video game cover artists who play the flute, the oboe, the saxophone, and the bassoon. Um, nice. So to have people enjoy what we do, getting to help with throne controllers, um, got, getting to run my own panel about, like, research I did um, going into my last year of college. Like, it just felt very surreal to get to bring together all these parts of, of who I am, like, you know, being a, a YouTuber, like a, a gamer, a musician, a teacher, a researcher, like getting to really bring all these parts of my life together, like was really awesome because I don't want to separate them. Like, you know, they are their own things, but I don't want to hide a piece of my identity from something else that I do because I think that really limits, you know, what you do. Yeah, and I think it's great on on your part because you can do all of those things at once. You can mm-hmm. perform, you can teach, you can 
um, be excited and be in the element of music and video games. And I think especially as, you know, nerd culture, I guess, if you want to call it that, has Mm -hmm. kind of evolved in the public perception over the last 10, 15 years. Absolutely. um, It's become a lot easier to, like, I guess for me, it was a lot more difficult for me as a kid to be very open about the things that I enjoyed, Mm -hmm. which, you know, costs thousands of dollars in therapy to fix. But (laughs) on top of that, um, you know, I, I'm able to feel more open about some of the things that I like because more and more people are coming out and talking about the things that they like as well. Uh, And yeah. yeah, And so you no longer have to really limit yourself. And I think you found a really nice like niche to kind of be in because you can do all those things at once. You have those opportunities for you. Right. Um, and like you said, like nerd, nerd culture, quote unquote, is being normalized. Um, you know, I remember because I, I had like similar experiences to you when I was a young kid. Um, when every everyone decided that when they were in fourth grade, so like age nine, that they like Pokemon was for babies and that they they weren't going to play Pokemon anymore. Like 10, yeah, like nine, 10 years old. Um, so like as like my later years of elementary school, Like, people knew that I liked Pokemon, and they made fun of me for it, so, like, I hid the fact that I liked it um, for a few years, and then when I got to middle school, I'm like, I don't care about what any of these, like, stupid people think about me. I'm like, why am I hiding what I care about? I was like, that's so pointless. Um, So, I, like, I kind of, like, claimed it proudly. I was like, yeah, I play video games. Um, And then people started getting back into Pokemon when I was uh, in my second year of high school. And people were having me look at their Pokemon teams because they knew that I played. (laughs) And I just, it felt kind of good, I'm not going to lie, to like deteriorate them over their crappy Pokemon teams. Because it'd be like like all legendaries with like one type of move. So like they'd have a Mewtwo that had all psychic moves. I'm like, well, first of all, you're a dummy. I'm like, they're just like, but it's a legendary. I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. I'm like, also, why does it only know psychic moves? I'm like, why doesn't it know this or this or this? So, like, I had a lot of fun getting to <laughs> to, to do that, like, flaunt my knowledge a little bit. Um. Yeah, I feel like we, <laughs> the Pokemon went out of style around the same time yeah. for the both of us. But for me, I was in, so it might have been like the same year. I think for me, I was in end of middle school i think and like yeah it was very it was very much like that it became very a not popular thing to like pokemon like it just yeah it just happened one summer yeah it it, was like one summer you came back or two that like 2008 2009 is around when it happened i think yeah um yeah for me it was like or well actually for me it it was unpopular by the time ruby and sapphire came out and none of, none of my friends wanted to talk about it. we all moved like quote unquote moved on it was for babies oh interesting and then 2006 2007 pretty much right when diamond pearl came out mm-hmm. i noticed that more and more people were suddenly playing it yeah and um i didn't get back into like i stopped playing after gold and silver came back to it for mm-hmm. platinum um so that was like my first game out from having not played it for a while I just kind of stuck with it. But yeah, it's it's unfortunate. Like nerd culture was very weird back in the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, the early 2000s it was very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Um but to have everything kind of come back and to be more accepted has been a lot easier to deal with, I'd say. Definitely. Uh, if you had one chance to do one video or project all over again, which one would it that be and what would you change about it? I would probably say I was like, as you were wrapping up, I'm like, let me pull up my YouTube channel really quickly to make sure that I <laughs> stick by my answer. You're getting prepared. Um, yeah. Getting prepared, doing my best. Um I mean I don't I don't want to say my first video because I feel like everyone feels that way. Um, even yeah, though like yeah. I do. I would say that like probably another one I would want to redo would be um Route 113 from Pokemon RSE. It's one of my favorite tracks of all time. Um, it's, it is my second favorite Pokemon track of all time. Mount Coronet uh, from Pokemon Diamond and Pearl is my favorite. Um, 
But the reason I'd want to redo it isn't because I'm not proud of it or anything. Um, I actually, that was a huge collaboration for me where I had, um, like, Family Jewels, Rashadi B, Ropan Aganti, um, just, like, a bunch of my friends, um, on that cover. And it was something really special for me because I spent, like, a year planning it, um, just because everyone's schedules are so busy. But I'd want to see what I could do with that knowing because like I did that right before I went off to college so like four years later I want to see how I can really push that orchestration further for a song that meant a lot to me and that I really transformed like how could I do that now with everything that I've learned and how could I make the video look really nice because I would edit it totally differently um (laughs) you know what I try and have like more life strings like you know just thinking about how could I make that super grand yeah when I think if it was something really important to you, it's not to redo it because you were unhappy. You know, with it, it doesn't devalue the experience right. that you had, but you want to give it like a bigger due diligence. Yes, now that you've learned so much. I think that's that's a really positive way to look at it. Uh, and finally, our last question: um, Who are some other content creators that you would say were the most influential to you? I know we kind of went over some of them, yeah. but um insane in the rain is definitely like he was one of my biggest inspirations when i first started and still like the the stuff that he does is absolutely incredible and i'm glad that like you know we we've grown like close over the years and that i have a really good friend to like bounce ideas off of ask like all my stupid questions um about like hey (laughs) um i probably should have learned this years ago but um (laughs) he's definitely up there family jewels because same thing with jewels where like i can just kind of like ask him like stupid questions and there and there's no judgment from him um <laughs> uh also even like not in the in the music field like um chugga conroy miss Ayanella, like you know just these people that are so passionate about what they do and are just very welcoming and inspiring um i could like list so many people in in the vgm community um just because they they've all really helped shape me into who I am um I think like two others I I really want to mention or sorry five more um is um (laughs) Ro Panagati um he he's such a sweetheart he does like a full-time tech job but then does these masterful VGM covers and is always like helping out the community very hands-on and Ro is like one of the first people that I actually got to talk to in the community and he kind of helped me like get into the community by like re- recommending I talk to some people um after there was like a community album done uh my friend Tara C Music who uh we've been so like she's a violinist and like you know I really resonated with her being a female content creator but also she does a lot more like slower stuff like things that are more ambient and that's kind of what I really like to do so it was nice to have like an ally um right and then my quartet um which like we played at magfest we had never played together and then like a few years ago we're like hey what if we like played some wind quartet stuff together and um we we just really help each other out as we all studied something different in music school and like you know we have very mixed experiences but we can come together to do this and that would be um Ape brigadier who's like who plays everything um but he's <laughs> he's a flutist um in my quartet uh medlix um her name's brooke she plays the oboe she's like an elementary school teacher and she's a wizard i love her and then um bassoonify who plays the bassoon like we all we have a very interesting work dynamic but you know we can come together at the end of our day as our lives are all very different and you know just make music and bond over the gripes of being a, a person <laughs> um so I'm, I'm happy that i get to have them and you know everyone in trg obviously because they're just they're a trip and i love them <laughs> yeah that's no, a it's a very big positive community yeah and, like to kind of go off that they've been very like helpful um and open it's you know time I think is the most valuable thing that anybody can give yes anybody and the fact that they are just so open and willing to give their time to just about anybody Mm -hmm. um like I don't know like they're willing to give their time to me uh, (laughs) um so the fact that like especially yourself too like we just spent an hour talking about yourself and um the fact that you were willing to come on and do this is is an amazing opportunity um 
always happy so. to help friends. You know that. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It's it's always hard to answer that question when people are like, "Well, who inspires you?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm like, how long do we have to answer this question?" Because <laughs> there, there's so many people. Like a lot. Yeah. There, there's so many people, and I guarantee you, there's like hundreds of people I miss, but those are the ones that are just coming to mind. Like I, I value so many people in the VGM community because they always teach me new things and allow me to grow and think about things that I never have thought about. So, you know, it, it's really cool that we really help each other learn and grow and that it's yeah, positive. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so that's it for our very first episode together. We Ooh. have three more to go. Yeah. Um, on the next episode, we will be talking more about technical stuff, so the equipment that you use, maybe the software, some tips and tricks on that, Absolutely. and uploading to YouTube. The worst part about YouTube. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and how that all works. So um, we're going to take a little break now. Uh, we'll be back with episode two, and then during that time, I will consider whether or not I'm going to pick the oboe back up. But until then, <laughs> uh, we hope to see you guys then. 